Are line arrays better than any other speakers? Can constant curvature get close to a line array? Are point sources just for fills or can I use them for mains? We're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna to make sure that you're familiar with all three of these speaker types so you know their specific strengths and weaknesses so you can pick the right ones and fit them like a glove to your show. My name is Michael Curtis. I love helping you get greater clarity in greater shows uh, because you can be fluid with sound system design and tuning. If you want to level up your game here, another tool I think you would also love is my Audio Mass Survival Spreadsheet. I've got that here, and it's got over 250 rows of calculations of all the fun, nerdy physics stuff that'll help you get great results in the field. You're not having to dig through books and get all these together. It's just in one spreadsheet for you. But one thing we talk about today is how line arrays actually end up steering low frequency energy because they are in a line. We go from this blob of low energy to a beam and we can predict that, we can predict the coverage shape. So if I got an eight foot line array, I could put that in here and say 141 Hertz is gonna be at 72 degrees. So I can know that coverage shape of my low frequencies and see if I have a long enough line to steer the low frequencies where I want to. That's just one of many calculations I think you find helpful. You can get that at the link below at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. I think you will enjoy it. All right, I'm looking forward to today. We're gonna to really dig into each of three speaker types and see how each of them can serve you on your shows and some things to watch out for in situations you might not wanna choose them. So let's jump in. Let's do a quick overview of all three speaker types. Then we'll jump back through each and offer some of the specific pros and cons so we can compare them for the best use cases on our shows. So first up is the point source. This is a single speaker cabinet. This word point source is used a little bit colloquially to kind of revert, refer to a generic speaker type, which we're gonna define. Uh, so technically a point source is sound coming from one single point then radiating outward equally. Uh, and a speaker that isn't very big uh, does, does that for the most part. So we just call it a point source. So it's a speaker that would live in this category is a QSC K12. It's just your normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill speaker. It can be a monitor, you can throw it on sticks, you can do whatever. So it is gonna fulfill that role for us. So just have that as an anchor in your mind for a point source is just like the single 12 and a tweeter, right? So you can also take a speaker off the bottom of a line array that's specifically designed for that, set it on the deck as a front fill, and now it is technically a point source because how things become a line array is that they're arrayed in a line. So if a box is no longer in a line, it is now a point source. So it's already getting a little bit hazy. Just wanna make that clear. It's not this speaker is a point source and this speaker is not. It's how you're using them together is really what separates them. But they are gonna have different design goals and qualities about them, even if you do take a line array speaker put on the deck versus a point source. So a point source can have multiple woofers, tweeters, horns, uh, but it's not substantially large enough to steer any low end. They usually have wider coverage angles. So they usually go up to about 100 degrees, usually not much narrower than 60, but you can also mix and match. You can have a 90 degree wide by 60 degree vertical or vice versa. So it makes them flexible to use in those types of situations. A single subwoofer is technically a point source as well, but we're not gonna dive into to, to that today with, with subs. But yeah, if someone says, give me a point source or give me a trap box, this is probably what they're referring to. Lastly, they also have lower SPL, SPL capabilities than constant curvature or line array since they don't have friends that they're working together with, but they still can get pretty loud if you need them to. All right, moving on to constant curvature arrays. So that is an array of two to seven speakers with a fixed splay angle. So what do I mean by splay angle? So a let's look at the JBL VRX 932 LAP. This is a speaker that's been around the industry for a long time. It has this trapezoidal shape and we could put them together. We just simply stack, 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 but it's, it's a slice of the pizza that has a 15 degree angle and that's its coverage. So we have several 15 degree cutouts that we can put together and make into a how big of a pizza slice do we want. So it is fixed. We cannot change the relationship of the boxes and how they're interacting with each other. Their physical way they butt up against each other makes it a constant curve. And if we add enough of them, we can go all the way in a complete perfect circle, but I think you're limited to seven that you can fly with the VRX. 
You can also put just two up on six or even just one. So now we're back to a point source. But most of the time, you'll probably end up flying three to five of them, depending on your show. These will have wide horizontal coverage. A, a VRX is 100 degrees. Some constant curvature rays out there are 110 over 120, but they have very narrow vertical. So that separates them from the point source is that it's not a 60 degree or 90 degree pattern. They're going to be the same coverage pattern of their angles to their friends in the array. So the VRX is 15. Some other ones from Personas that think are 20. So anyway, so that's, that's, that's how they're going to work together is their their splay angle is going to separate the high energy because we know that we can steer high frequencies pretty well but we can't low so their low ends are going to couple and form a beam but each box has its own little high frequency zone and it's not overlapping with its friends so the more boxes you add the more vertical coverage you get so i can add a box 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 and so if i have a audience i need to cover i can measure that angle and and see well if this is a 45 degrees of total coverage from my rigging point to the first row in the back row i'm going to need at least three boxes of jbl vrx to get 45 degrees and probably one more because it always doesn't work out that nicely <laughs> so uh, you also get more spl with a constant curvature array because we have more boxes that are closely coupled and can work together and couple on the back of these you can adjust level and eq and we'll talk about how we can tweak that a little bit later on in the video to make sure we have uniform coverage. And these are for low to mid SPL capabilities because they can couple, they can get louder because they are working together with their friends and they're not just on their own with a single woofer trying to do all the job or a woofer and a horn. All right, moving on to line array. A line array is usually three to up to 24 speakers with variable splay angle between their friends. So they are arrayed together, so they're hung in a column that kind of J's out, right? So an example of this is an RCF HDL6A. I just use this rig all the time in town, so we'll, we'll use this. You could put three of them on a stick, you put, could put one of them on the front of the stage as a front fill, so we're back to our point source, but usually they're flown together in groups and they have group think. So they have, the lows are steered a little bit, which we'll talk about It's one of their pros because they're together and they can help form a low beam and help, instead of this blob that's coming out, we get to focus a beam. But we get to change the coverage shape of the whole array by the variables between the boxes. So if we have all the boxes hung, let's say at one degree, they're all overlapping each other. So they're gonna make this tightly focused high frequency beam that is like a more like a sniper rifle, right? It's going to go far. Otherwise, let's say we put them all at 10 degrees, it's all going to make this big, you know, kind of like half circle thing and fan out. And so we're going to spread out the high frequency energy. And so there might be a specific use case, this might be normal, but probably going to be somewhere in between. Usually our arrays are hung and we need to get the top boxes to go all the way to the back, maybe 100 feet away. But by the time we get to the bottom of the array, it's not very far. Maybe they're only throwing 20 feet. So that is a five to one distance ratio that we need to overcome is by tightening up those angles in the boxes and get them to couple together in the high frequencies and throw far and then spreading them out at the bottom is how we can get a different coverage shape throughout the array. So we're going to see it slowly unfurl as we go through the bottom with normal audience shapes. There are exceptions here, but most of the time we're trying to get stuff to the back uh, and make it even all the way to the front. You can also use EQ on shading on each box to get different tonalities and make a couple differently. One thing to make sure is of you need to make sure you have the right preset on your amp or DSP. This is also true for a point source or constant curvature, I forgot to mention it, but a lot of these days are using complementary filters that the manufacturer has given us to make sure you're getting the best results from your box. These are from medium to high SPL applications. You can always turn it down if you know this is a corporate event, it's a small room, but we have some that are can be 150 <laughs> dB at one meter. You know, I'm thinking about the, the new Meyer Panther line array speaker. It's 150, D, 150 dB. The HDL6A I just referenced from RCF, it's a lot smaller box. 
its peak SPL at one meter is 131 dB. So I'd say 19 dB difference, which means the Panther can get nine times louder. <laughs> so that, that's a big difference. So uh, make sure you have the right size line array speaker for your application. If you need to throw an entire football field, you need a Panther. If you're in a smaller to mid-size arena show or don't have to go crazy loud, then you can get away with something like an HDL6A. One is not inherently better than the other. You just need to choose the right size rig for the right size show. All right, so let's jump into the details of the point source and its specific strength and features and then some of its weaknesses and why you might choose it over the other two on a show. So a point source is great for small to medium size audience. So especially clubs with low ceilings, because if we have a big giant line array in a club, we're going to be dragging on the ground before we finish our coverage shape, right? So these are small, they're portable, you can throw them up. Uh, you still want to get them high in most venues, but they're not going to be this big eyesore, right? They come in variable coverage patterns per model. So let's say if you have one, uh, Let's see, I know RCF has a specific speaker that escapes me that you can get it in a 90 by 90, a 90 by 60, a 60 by 60. So you can be really customizable of the exact coverage that you need within the same speaker line. So that, that's pretty cool. They're pretty small, they're light, they're portable. You can take a QSC K12, you can throw it up on a stick by yourself so you don't always have to have a friend for a setup. There are low, they're lower power requirements. So, you know, they're not designed to get crazy loud, so they don't need to d draw a lot of voltage. So you're not going to have to worry about putting, you know, a couple of tops, a couple of subs on one circuit, and you're still going to sleep well at night. Always check your power requirements and the, the specific speakers you have. But I know that the, the K12s with their complementary subs, the KS118s, I can run those on one circuit and not blink an eye. Um, and lastly, you have a variety of mounting options with a point source box traditionally. You can use M10 bolts, are very popular to screw into the box, then mount them. You can put them horizontally, vertically, you can put them on a stick. You could put a, a pole in your sub and mount them on that for even less hardware and a smaller footprint. So they're very flexible. So now let's talk about their weaknesses. You cannot overcome high range ratios with a point source. So the center of a point source throws its lattice point, and as you move towards its coverage edge, both horizontally and vertically, you're going to lose energy. And so a 90 degree box means as it's 45 degree edge, we're going to be 6 dB down, which works in our favor because we do want it to, and let's say we're pointing it at the back of our audience, we do want to get softer so the loud part can throw towards the back because it's going farther and it's gradually getting softer and they're going to meet at the front of our audience. But the range ratio that's only designed to overcome since we're losing half is two to one. Once we get beyond that, we're going to start to get a bigger discrepancy between the back row and the front row as far as tonal, tonal uniformity and level uniformity. So we... Uh, can't use them with a very super deep audience without adding delay speakers, which is something we can easily do with point sources. Number two, they have lower SPL capabilities, even with larger boxes. So line arrays are by far going to be able to get louder because they work together with their friends and can couple. So it's really hard to go it alone. Number three, you have no low frequency directivity. How you get low frequencies to start forming a beam and go where you want them to is to array speakers together because their arrival times are going to be similar at the front and not at the side. So we're going to have the, the low end energy focus there. So with the single point source, that's physically impossible to steer <laughs> low frequencies. So uh, it's a fixed pattern. Once you start getting below 1K and it gets more spherical, the lower you go in frequency. So a single point source, there's no low end directivity. So that's something like a uh, your front fills or your floor wedges. If you have a bunch of those on your stage, you can get a lot of low end buildup because it's all just spilling everywhere. So don't be afraid to use a low shelf or something on those speakers to help dial in some of that low mid to low bleed. Uh, and number four, they're designed mostly for install rigging, not touring rigging. So smaller shows, we just throw them on a stick. Yeah, that, that, that cup is always there. But if you want to fly them, you have to screw in the M10 bolts. You have to like customize some aircraft cable. So they're not made to throw in the air quickly for touring situations. All right, so the details and strengths and weaknesses of constant curvature. The, number one, it's quick setup. You get the rigging frame ready. You put one on, two. You're not even thinking about splay angles since they're fixed. So you just pin the boxes and you send them up. 
Number two, it can be a really tightly focused front fill. So a VRX is 100 degrees wide, so having a wide box as a front fill is usually good because you have to cover a lot of people quickly since it's a short throw distance. But if it's 15 degrees, that means you're not getting all this high frequency energy shot up into the ceiling or bouncing off the floor. So it can be tightly focused if you aim it correctly right at the audience's heads. So they may not work in your favor if you have a really low stage or a very high stage, but it's really cool if you do have it work out where you got a five foot tall stage, put a front fill on there and it's right at most people's heads. Number three, you can technically get uh, more level uh, than a single box because of coupling. So they, they're more efficient because they're right next to the friends and they can get louder. We've talked about that. And number four, strength, it has some low frequency directivity. The more boxes you add, so let's see if you got four together, we're gonna start to get some of that beam and focus energy in a constant curvature array. It's not this blob of low mids just coming off the array. So that's definitely a plus because we don't, we wanna steer all frequencies at the audience and keep them all off the stage or the sidewalls, right? So any directivity at all frequencies is really helpful. And number five is you can use high frequency shading to help overcome the range ratios, kind of. This is, you know, if you got four in an array and one's going to the back row and one's going to the front row and it's a four to one range ratio, a lot of boxes are specifically in the 932s. You can press a button or two buttons on the back to get it to have a high end boost. And then the bottom box, you can have a, a high end cut. So you can help even out some of the energy front to back. Again, we have a fixed tonality because of the beam with the lows and low mids. So we can have an unmatch, it's too bright and too dark and the mids are somewhere in the middle. So this is up to your tuning preferences and your show scope to really figure out. But no, you do have some of that flexibility to have some of the high end uh, be shaped throughout the array. All right, here's our three weaknesses for constant curvatures. No splay angle change because it has in, it means it has inflexible coverage shapes. So you're basically stuck with, I want 15, 30, 45, or if you have a 20 degree box, 20, 40, 60, 80, and you have to work in those increments. So if you need to be in between, that's kind of hard. Um, so you have to work in increments of like, how many boxes do I have? So if there's only eight on the truck, you can only do four and four, or I need two of those to be front fills. Great, you're stuck with three and three. That means you're stuck with a 45 degree HF coverage shape which may or may not be desirable for your show. Number two, you have limited DSP tool sets. So you have to use an external processor most of this time uh, since you don't have traditional line array shading and tools and, and splay angles. So you, you either have what's physically on the box or have to drag in something external to control all that. And number three, you have to watch your sight lines. So if we have these boxes on a low venue and you have four of them, that can start to get pretty low compared to a single point source that you can tuck up high. So just make sure you have that uh, in mind when you're designing the array. Now let's dive into line arrays and discuss their strengths and weaknesses. So number one, their strength is the HF coverage shape is highly malleable as, low, as well as the low end. But because we have the ability to change the splay angles between our boxes and feather that down the array, we can really start to get really cool coverage shapes and overcome range ratios as high as maybe six or seven to one, which is hard to have, you know, a single array throwing seven times farther to the back row than to the front row, but still have a uniform tonality and level throughout the audience. And line arrays are the only speaker sets capable of, of achieving that because you can have tight splay angles at the top and start to unfurl it as you move towards the bottom. Number two is if you have a long line, you can really start to shape the low mid shape of the array. And so you can look and see that 72 degrees of coverage in the array is gonna be equal to the wavelength uh, that is equal to the array length. So an eight foot line array, uh, the frequency that corresponds with that wavelength is 120 her 125 hertz. So 125 hertz is gonna be 72 degrees at that point. And we're gonna be able to get a tighter one if we move up an octave, and then we're going to uh, have a doubling of that if we move down an octave. So that's just a really good pivot point to memorize and know is that the frequency does equal wavelength with the array, I'm at 72 degrees. So the longer the line, the more we're able to tightly focus and beam that low mid energy to have that same kind of pointed coverage shape at the top. 
and then it kind of skate over the top of our audience so we have even front to back. Number three, you have higher possible SPL with large format boxes. Like I mentioned earlier, the Meyer Panther is a 150 dB capable box, which is insano. And so you can really have that coupled together and throw very long distances. And last thing that I think is a strength in the feature is they just look cool. Line arrays, you know, having this big giant thing hanging down there look great. So that's just, I think, a cool feature about them. All right, we got five weaknesses and then we will land this plane. Number one is more boxes is more money. So for line arrays to work best, you need to have a lot of boxes, especially if a high range ratio or you really care about stirring your low mid energy that requires more amps, more DSP and more boxes. So that cost can add up quickly. Number two, you need a high trim height with long arrays. You may not always have that. So if you're in an arena with really high steel, not a big deal, but you have to talk with other departments, maybe video, is hanging their projector somewhere or they have to have some sight line to the stage. And so you need to make sure that this big giant black thing you're gonna be hanging isn't in anyone's way from a sight line or just overall production perspective. So you can't use line arrays in venues with low ceilings or at least you can't use very many boxes. Number four is they are heavy <laughs> most of the time. And so they, you're gonna, definitely going to need a friend and multiple people to, to get them arrayed together and all put together and send up in an array so you cannot do them by yourself. And number five, um, our recovery need to watch your, your sight lines in the array. So that's related to high trim height. You got long arrays. Long arrays could drop into sight lines. So make sure you have that covered and accounted for in your arrays. So let's recap. We have point sources. You're just generic, run-of-the-mill speaker. They're very flexible. You can throw them anywhere. If I was showing up to especially like a political gig in a smaller venue, I would just say like, give me an army of like K8s and K10s so I can just have them small and mighty and throw them anywhere and cover where I need to. So they are a great box just to have as a utility for fill speakers or for smaller venues as your mains. You can just throw them up on a stick, get them high and you can go. Constant curvature, you cannot change the splay angle between the boxes. But so but that makes them fast to throw up and go. You have minimal DSP settings, but they are great. If you need a little bit higher SPL and you can fly and your range ratio is higher than two to one, and you can do some HF shading in those boxes to help overcome that. Number three, line arrays are big. Uh, most of the time they can get they can get louder than their other cousins and you can change the splay angles between the boxes to create the perfect coverage shape to match the audience that you need. Again, my name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you learned something and know a little bit more about those three buckets of tools we can select for on our show. Don't forget to go to the link below and check out my Audio Mass Survival spreadsheet. I think it'll be really helpful to you and I will catch you next time.